All right, hello. Today I'd like to talk about some uh, visualization of morphological evolution of a copper electrode deposition system where we're going to look at different methods for controlling morphology, both passive and active uh, methods. I would like to thank everyone that helps me, especially Jung Park and uh, Francis Ross. They're the ones who really sit down at the microscope with me and help me turn the knobs. But the, the team here that works on this project is very large. I'm very lucky to have a lot of support, so I'd like to thank them too. And naturally, we need to thank our uh, sponsors, the NSF sponsors this research. So we want to look at what happens during electro deposition. We use copper as a model system because it's a system that's been well studied for interconnects in electronic devices and for other different plating techniques. And to do this, we, uh, and then we, what we really want to probe is what causes different morphology instabilities such as dendrite formation, which can be catastrophic when you're recharging your batteries. The way that we do this is we use the Nano Aquarium, which is a homebrew device created by Grogan and Bau at the University of Pennsylvania. And this is basically two TEM wafers that have been chemically bonded together with a very thin spacer of tens or hundreds of nanometers thick made out of silicon oxide. So we get a completely sealed device. Uh, unlike the, the devices that you sandwich together commercially where you have some other spacer, this is lithography held constant, which is really nice because then we can use standard lithography to deposit electrodes that are well-controlled geometries, which are very important for doing the electrochemistry. And so we have a very good understanding of the geometry of our electrodes and where they show up in the cell. And we have four electrodes built in, so we can do standard three electrode uh, electrochemical experiments. So when we, we take our videos, we get very nice qualitative data. We get these very beautiful videos, but we need a way to quantify what we are seeing. So we've developed an image processing technique that's completely unsupervised, non-parametric, meaning once I put the video in and do rotation and cropping, it just runs for however long the video is, and we are able to extract the growth edge of this morphology. And we can see in the video on the left, in a faint white overlay, that this process is very good at extracting the interface morphology as it grows, even though we have these dendrites which are very difficult to, uh, to detect. So we've done a pretty good job of automating that. And now that we have this quantitative data, we need to come up with a couple ways of measuring it to see what's important with the actual evolution of the interface. So the first thing that comes to mind to look at is we can say uh, this graph on the top left. Here we're doing a relatively low current density where we don't see large instabilities. And we do it for a long time. The total deposition time is 350 seconds, but we do this in 10 second pulses. So the total experiment is 700 seconds. We go through and we, get the, we extract the growth edge. And then what I'm plotting on the left in the black is the average height. The blue, uh, the blue in this case is the maximum height. I reversed the colors there, I apologize. And the red is the minimum height. And we can see that the average growth rate for the whole experiment is pretty constant. And that the, after some initial broadening of the difference between the max and min height, that the, the difference stays approximately the same until the very end. And we'll get to the very end in a moment. So the next measure that I like to take is the RMS roughness, which is a measure of the width of the interface. Because we can see as we're developing that the interface is not perfectly smooth because of natural perturbations that happen during this deposition, you're always going to have some waviness that exists. And if we measure that waviness and measure how much the RMS roughness grows with time, we see that in the early stage we have a roughening regime. And this is akin to kinetic roughening, which is a well-studied field for many different non-equilibrium growths. And we grow, the RMS roughness grows as a function of time to the beta, where beta is 0.3. After some time, we see a saturation of the RMS roughness. And this is expected because we have different physics that are going on here. We're applying a current. It's a constant current experiment. So we have some need to deposit ions in order to maintain that current. But then there's also surface diffusion, where the copper 2, after it's been reduced to a copper 1, has time to move around the surface and play a smoothing role. At the very end of the experiment, we grow again. At this case, it's a very small growth exponent. Uh, it might look like it's sharp here, but when you measure the growth exponent, you have to time shift the curve. So if we were to take that last part of the curve and plot it from time 0 instead of time 150, it would be a very shallow growing curve. And that's why we get a growth exponent of 0.1. And what that is due to is because there's some wave selection going on here. And you can see at the very last frame in the bottom right that there is a very obvious wavelength that has developed uh, throughout this experiment. Even though early on we had a, a rough surface that was randomly rough based on the lithography of the platinum electrode, at the very end we end up seeing some wave selection. That's because the interplay between the desire to deposit and surface diffusion. 
So we want to actually be able to measure that. So in the top left here, what I've done is taken an autocorrelation. So since we're viewing a two micron window total, we don't have much signal to extract the actual wavelengths. So I can't do a regular Fourier analysis because the peaks are all hidden in that of the, the zero uh, frequency peak. So I do an autocorrelation, which is where we take the waviness of the surface, and you do a cross-correlation with itself in space. So what I'm plotting here on the, is the value of the autocorrelation, which has been normalized between plus and minus one, or blue and red, where blue is a strong correlation. That's why you'll always have a peak at zero, because if you take a surface and correlate it with itself with no shift, it always has to exactly line up because it is itself. Uh, whereas then as we take these two curves and then we move them, basically raster them over each other, we, get diff we see what other wavelengths exist there. And we do this as a function of time, the deposition time in the experiment. In the early times, you can see that there's a very broad array of uh, aspects that are showing up here and there's no real dominant peaks. Uh, there's a little bit of one uh, near 450 nanometers, but nothing, uh, nothing dominant. And what this is implying is that there are many wavelengths that are existing for a long time in this experiment. So it's expected that the wavelengths that exist during the growth in the early phases will be interacting and fighting, and it'll take some time for a dominant wavelength to emerge. And that's what we can start to see uh, halfway through the deposition, where there is a wavelength that emerges, and by the very end, we get that blue peak in the top right corner of that graph, which lines up perfectly with what you can measure from the image itself, where a wavelength has developed. Now to understand the transients of which wavelengths are dominant, that's a very difficult mathematical problem that we're still working on, but we do expect the wavelength to grow with time. If we were to let this go on forever until we reach steady state conditions rather than this very transient regime, the wavelength in this type of copper electric deposition would be 50 microns. So this is something that we can't even probe with our window size here. So we'll never see that long time, long length scale develop. But we can begin to see what's happening with these uh, in, with these shorter wavelengths that are interacting in the early time. And that's what's leading to this roughness growth. Next, I'd like to move on to the case where we drive the system at a higher current density, and when we do lead to these large perturbations, uh, the dendrite-like structures. On the left, again, we're plotting the maximum height in red, the average height in black, and the minimum height in blue. So you will have the transition to this type of growth morphology when your surface concentration goes to zero of your depositing ion. And so once you've gone to that point, you're in a diffusion-limited regime. So now, since you have no excess ions near your growth interface, the ions have to uh, fight to get to the interface, which means they're always going to follow the path of least resistance or highest conductivity. So we know that even when we have excess ions, we're going to get some waviness. That means there's always going to be peaks and pits. So what happens when you reach a diffusion-limited regime are all the deposited ions are going to go to the peaks, and this is going to abound, giving you an exponential growth in this waviness. And we can really see that here where we have some point where we're growing, we haven't depleted the solution, so we started from a stagnant solution with a constant concentration. We grow for a while in a similar way to the low current density deposition, where the maximum and min slightly separate as they're growing, but then at some point, the minimum peak that we're measuring stops. It goes completely stagnant, while the average growth rate is still growing at about the same. We can see that there is an acceleration in the peak, and this is because the ions are now selectively depositing at the peaks of the interface. Ultimately, what happens is we see a third regime where everything goes flat and everything goes stagnant. This is because since we've reached this diffusion-limited regime, at this point, there is another asperity that's outside the field of view that is growing and consuming all of the ions, and we no longer can see that. And we have video evidence from other places where, fortuitously, we just happen to have a dendrite that's growing right next to our region, where that continues to grow even though where we originally were imaging stopped growing essentially completely. When we look at the RMS roughness, this next measure of the growth interface, we see that in the very early stages before this transition, before the onset of diffusion limited regime, we have that, again, that 0.3 growth exponent where we're just roughening. We just have this fighting between wavelengths. And then we transition to the diffusion limited regime where the growth exponent more than doubles to 0.8. To give you a little more physics of these growth exponents, if you were to do a completely random deposition, just imagine an unphysical world where you take and drop particles down columns 
completely random form, randomly, you will have a Poisson process, so you have uniform deposition, and with that you'd get a growth exponent of 0.5 that goes on forever. So if you have a growth exponent greater than 0.5, you're depositing selectively at the peaks. If it's less than 0.5, you have some other physics such as surface diffusion that's allowing you to smooth out the surface. So 0.3 is a very good uh, growth exponent because that means we have some roughening, but it's not growing in an unabated fashion. Now if we look at the wavelengths, we again see in the very short times that there are many wavelengths that exist. And as we continue with the deposition, notice the time scale now is only 12 seconds compared to 700 seconds in the low current. Uh, density, we see that eventually some wavelengths do start to emerge, and especially when we hit that onset of the diffusion limited regime, we end up getting a very selected wavelength, and that's one that you can again measure from the videos if you look at the spacing between these asperities. So we have this early time where we, we haven't reached the diffusion limited regime. If you do a one-dimensional model of deposition and figure out the time it takes for the surface excess concentration to drop to zero, you'll retrieve the sand equation. And if we plug in our experimental parameters, we get in a 1D simplified model, we're not even considering the interface moving, we get a time of 2.11 seconds. When we compare that to what we see here, we get a, a transition around three seconds. So this 1D model that's not even considering the physics of what's going on in the deposition itself is very good at predicting when we have transitions. So this is a nice tool for us as experimentalists to be able to figure out when, what we need to avoid if we want to avoid these type of uh, asperities, the diffusion limited regime. However, it also gives us a chance that maybe we can exploit something. We know that these short times, before we've depleted the surface excess ions, that we're going to have roughening as if it were a low current density. And so now we have some time that we can use to develop active controls to avoid these type of asperities. So if we take and we deposit at the same current density, we're using that long time, the 12 second example that I showed there. Uh, we deposit that for one second stop, wait five seconds to allow diffusion to replenish the ions, and then grow again, we end up getting a nice surface that's growing without these large asperities. And if we measure the average growth exponent for that experiment, we see that as 0.5. So this is akin to uniform deposition in this uh, simple measure of the system. We can again look at the wavelengths going on. And what's really cool here is remember I said that we, we always have this peak at zero, but then the size of this kind of tells us how many of the short wavelengths are available to us or that are, exist. As we continue to deposit, this is in the real time, not just the deposition time, we can see that every time we deposit, the number of short wavelengths actually increases, so we're smoothing out this autocorrelation. And this is really cool because if you watch the video, our initial electrode is actually very rough in this experiment. And you can see some asperities that exist there already. And as it grows through the first few depositions, they really stick out here. But then as it continues to grow, it smooths out. So this pulsing technique actually helped us, even though we had a very rough electrode to begin with, that helped us with continuing to have a smooth surface. So this is very nice. If you were to do the 1D model again and actually apply the square wave pulsing of constant current where it's on, off, and for, the, for, these, simulation, for these parameters in this experiment, you would find that you can get about five cycles before you uh, end up going to zero surface concentration. So it's again on the same order of what we're seeing in the experiments. So these active methods are very nice, but eventually, even if you have active controls, you're going to deplete your solution. So you need to have other either passive controls or flow to uh, counteract these large asperities. And so something else we looked at was the uh, addition of additives or surfactants to this system. We decided to use lead as an additive in our copper solution. And here we got perfectly flat growth. So we can see that even though there's some waviness in the RMS, that we essentially kept the growth exponent to zero and we did not see any roughening in this situation. If we look at the wavelength, the autocorrelation, we see that as a function of time, it didn't change. So here, lead is acting somewhat as a surfactant, which uh, could potentially be slowing down the reaction rate, because we do see that the growth rates as a function of the applied current, uh, the total applied current, not just the current density, are a little bit slower than we see in the plain copper solution. So presumably, what's happening is the lead is acting to uh, aid surface diffusion so that the surfaces are staying smooth. And we still see all of those wavelengths existing throughout the experiment, meaning we're not having that wave selection. So with that, I'd like to say that we've developed a way of quantitatively looking at our surface growth, our morphology changes. And we use measures of the max min height, the average height, 
we use the RMS roughness and then also the extracted wavelengths via autocorrelations in order to try and understand what's happening in our systems when we use active passive controls and then also the basic understanding of what happens when you do copper electrode deposition. With that, I would like to take any questions.